thank you and thanks for coming. Um, it's great to meet you and to have a chance to talk about this wonderful book. Um, I wanted to start with that wonderful uh, essay from the uh, great Kenyan satirist uh, Binyavanga Wanaina, uh, who, 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 who wrote that um, mind-blowingly good essay, How to Write About Africa, uh, by which he meant, of course, how all of us who write about the continent should stop representing it. Um, he stung with the following. Broad brushstrokes throughout are good. Avoid having the African characters laugh or struggle to educate their kids or just make do in mundane circumstances. Have them illuminate something about Europe or America in Africa. African characters should be colorful, exotic, larger than life, but empty inside with no di dialogue, no conflicts or resolutions in their stories, no depth or quirks to confuse the cause. Perhaps we could start there since it seems to me that your book is precisely what he's advocating in it, his essay, and that is a portrayal of Africans as people with their own agency uh, and idiosync idiosyncrasies and a sense of destiny. So what inspired the project in the first place? Um, were you just fed up with the way Africa was being reported on, uh, what you call poverty porn? Um, yes, that's the short answer. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for being here, and uh, I'm glad that you chose this particular uh, essay, which really does have a lot of resonance. Um, Binyo was writing about fiction, um, but I think when it comes to nonfiction, which is my discipline, the same kind of narrative biases replicate, um, where you reference poverty porn, where even in the most recent weeks when we've been sort of thinking about the stories that have gotten our attention about Africa, it hasn't been the, uh, it's been, it's been the, the awful kidnapping of Nigerian school children, rather than, you know, decades, weeks, months, years of slow, unsexy economic development, for example. It's sort of hard to grab our attention when the story is one of generally incremental positive gains. Um, so to that extent, I think uh, that's a very good example of the way the sort of nonfiction media industry, the, report, the reporters community of which I find myself a part, struggles to get the attention of the world at large surrounding issues of, of African development and ordinary Africa. Now with respect to my book, I'm very proud that there are no animals in this book. Um, I always advertise a book about Africa without animals. Um, and I didn't realize that that was, until I looked at the manuscript, you know, when it was finished, I went through, I was like, oh my gosh, like, I did it. Like, there was no, you know, no safaris, no sunsets, none of that. I think this book is um, sort of a user's manual for the Africa that you have not heard about, um, the very ordinary things. And I think given that my background is one of someone who was born in the U.S. right here in Chicago, but spent a lot of time in lots of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, it's given me a unique perspective on, you know, where we're missing the mark, what we're not understanding, and the ordinary things like giving directions um, that here we would say we're coming to 700 South State Street. Um, but if you were in Nairobi, where I lived while I was reporting the book, you would be like, okay, so you're going to look for the petrol station, um, that's the total, and then if you see a yellow building, you've gone too far. So ask someone, and then double back, and then, you know, and so it's all contextual. And it's these very ordinary little differences between different types of societies um, that I seek to illuminate, which is, you know, not as sensational or as gripping as a story of a kidnapping or, uh, you know, a multi-million dollar banking transaction, but is really the substance of what's the, the real Africa and the one that I try to illuminate in the bright continent. So uh, let's pick up there and, and talk a little bit about how being a homegrown Chicagoan um, and from a Yoruba-speaking Nigerian family, mm -hmm. how, how, how that informed the way you approached uh, the story you wanted to tell? Hmm. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in Nigeria, and that sort of shuttle diplomacy, right, between Washington, where I was working as a reporter, covering American politics, covering uh, the State Department, international development, and home. <laughs> Um, really, again, sort of illuminated for me where we were missing the mark. Um, I was inspired to write the book not just by the sort of casual conversations and 
the fortune I've had to be able to go back and forth, uh, I think there are a lot of da African diaspora immigrants who do not have that opportunity to go home and just feel like it's just another, another side of relevance for them. Um, but it was when I was covering uh, the United Nations Week, which is the General Assembly every September, everyone comes to New York, traffic's crazy, every single head of state and all of their entourages are there in New York. Um, and in 2010, it was the 10th anniversary of the famous Millennium Development Goals, which was the blueprint for you know, solving poverty in, in 15 years with these uh, simple steps. And as a journalist, as an American journalist working for an American publication, um, I was watching this presentation and the United Nations had a poster competition to commemorate the 10th anniversary. And the winning poster they selected goes to this issue of agency you were mentioning. Um, at the top of the photo, and there's a photo of it in the book, so it's kind of hard to describe. Uh, from the bottom up, sorry, from the waist up, it was uh, the leaders of the G8 in their suits. Um, and you could tell because Angela Merkel was the lone woman in a pantsuit. Uh, and from the waist down, it had um, what I could only assume were sort of African children in a refugee camp. Right, and no faces. No faces, right? They were cut off from the waist, but they had no shoes. They were waiting in line. And the tagline read, Dear World Leaders, We Are Still Waiting. And that just jolted my sensibilities. It took me out of my role as an American reporter and put me in the role of a sort of irritated African. <laughs> um, because I think anyone who spent time in sub-Saharan Africa knows that people work twice as hard to get half as far. Um, the idea that someone could be sitting around and waiting is preposterous, you know. Um, my very first trip to Nigeria, I remember being floored at like what you could buy in traffic. You know, I was like 10 years old, nose pressed up against the glass in traffic, seeing people selling fruit, electronics, you know, uh, art, <laughs> people selling, you know, anything you could think of, live animals, D VCR or, or D VHS tapes, which dates me a little bit. Um, and, and that's an, an enormous amount of energy, agency, ambition, dynamism, and forced innovation. Um, and I think that ended up being the sort of resonant theme of the Bright Continent was, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, Africa is the mother of necessity. And, uh, and we're missing that, you know, as someone, as, as the world, including the United Nations, you know, the people who ought to be thinking most critically about what life is like contextually in poorer countries. Um, and so that, I think within a month, I had like liquidated all of my things and moved and started writing this book. Mm. As you set off, what were the misconceptions that you were carrying yourself into that situation? What were the biggest surprises for you? Oh, great question. Um, I'll answer it in two ways. One, I think um, formality bias is a term I coin in the book to talk about the expectation that things should look as organized as they look in the United States or another wealthy Western country. Um, it's a presumption that like getting directions means <laughs> just using Google Maps or whatever and you just suddenly get where you're going. Um, and I think that extends to the sort of role and reach of government. As someone who is, you know, a good liberal who grew up in Hyde Park, you know, and who covered American politics, um, to realize that the connection between the citizen and the state all across Sub-Saharan Africa was bankrupt. That ended up being a huge part of what I realized was driving all of the innovations I went on to document. And the reason why people were um, needing to generate systems of production for workers that had nothing to do with for the formal sector, people needing to find ways to provide a social safety net without a government support, people finding ways to create health solutions and energy solutions in the absence of you know, electricity. All of these things were driven by a fundamental uh, lack of belief in government. And I think for me, coming from a place where of course there's garbage collection, where of course these lights aren't gonna go out, uh, that was one very important difference for me in terms of trying to understand the sort of political economy of what I was writing about. Um, and I'm sure we can talk much more about that because I think there's lots of different uh, ways to think about the role of the, in reach of the state in Africa and everywhere. Uh, the second was agriculture. Um, you know, this book, when I first started conceiving it, and when I first started to sort of talk about it with folks and pitch it, it was a book about cell phones. It was like, cell phones have come into Africa, and everyone's connected, and now we have a democratic moment, people are solving problems. All of that is true, um, but I think the sort of very basic sort of, you know, 
two out of every three people on the continent is touched by agriculture. Food, 